Poland pledges to consult Moscow on the U.S.'s plans to build a missile defense system in the country. And Russia's military chief warns Moscow's ready to use nuclear weapons to defend itself. What's behind the military talk? And is Russia an emerging threat? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Jane Doughton. So what's going on between Moscow and the West? In some ways, they're closer than ever. Trade and cultural ties are strong, with Russia's nouveau riche buying heavily into Europe. But politically, there's been a mounting war of words that some say marks the biggest East-West chill since the end of the Cold War. Latest signs include a diplomatic spat that's seen Russia close down British cultural offices in Moscow and St. Petersburg. That's all part of a tit-for-tat row surrounding the murder of the former KGB agent Alexander Litvinenko. Meanwhile, there's been fierce military rhetoric from Russia's chief of staff who's claimed Moscow could use nuclear weapons if forced to in preemptive strikes. Well, there are a few issues Russia has repeatedly disagreed on with other countries around the world. Russia's clashed with the United States over Washington's plans to base a missile defense system in Poland and the Czech Republic. Moscow says the presence of U.S. missiles like these in its neighbors would threaten its security. Russia sides with Serbia on the issue of Kosovo, doesn't recognize the Albanian majority area in Serbia as an independent state, but many EU countries support Kosovo's drive for independence. Many of those see EU countries rely heavily on Russia for its energy needs, but some countries say the state-controlled Gazprom doesn't do enough to ensure gas supplies will keep up with demand. And then there's the issue of Iran. Russia's helped build Tehran's nuclear program, but until December, stalled on having its contractors finish the job. Joining us to discuss this enormous issue are our guests in Moscow, Alexander Pikiev, member of the Institute of World Economy and International Relations and advisor to the Defense Committee at the State Duma. In London, Martin McCauley, a Russia expert at the University of London. And in Berlin, Henning Rieke, head of European Foreign Policy and Security Program at the German Council of Foreign Relations. Mr. Pikiev, how bad is this relationship really? Are we seeing a, an acrimonious separation from the West or is it an all-out divorce? Well, so far, uh, I don't think we could speak about a catastrophe. Yes, relations are tense. There are some uh, disagreements, particularly Kosovo, missile defense. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think both sides, Russia and uh, major Western nations, are ready to continue their cooperation on another uh, issues which are of uh, mutual interest particularly on afghanistan uh, particularly on iran today there was very important ministerial uh, meeting uh, in berlin regarding uh, new u.n security council uh, resolution and uh, with participation of russia and five western uh, uh, Ch russia china and uh, uh, four uh, Western countries, and uh, it demonstrates that cooperation still goes on, and uh, saying that uh, uh, particularly on Iran, uh, interests of Russia uh, differs from the interests of the West, it would be, I think, too premature to say. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, countries would find uh, modus vivendi eventually. There would be new Russian president. Uh, this president uh, is considered to be quite liberal, uh, pro, uh, quite pro-Western, and under this new president, uh, the relations, uh, I, uh, we hope, uh, could recover. Mr. Rike, do you agree that this cooperation, as mentioned by Mr. Pikiev, do you think it's enough? I believe that there is um, there are a number of reasons why Russia has stepped up its rhetoric and uh, uh, more confrontative attitude in the in the past year. I think one of the most important reasons is uh, um, the phase of transition, the elections that were that were due. Uh, where the Putin government tried to rally support with some national, nationalist uh, arguments. Uh, but I believe much of this confrontation is, is going to stay with us because Russia now from a position of power is trying to like, redefine um, the order in Europe and in its, in its neighborhood, trying to, to redefine the rules that it had to accept from a weaker position after the end of the Cold War. Um, in all that, I believe that the West must be like, 
tougher in some areas, uh, for instance, with regard to Kosovo, but must be more, more cooperative and looking for partnership in other areas. And here I agree that uh, uh, there is uh, abundant opportunity for cooperation. Both sides want, want to have an energy partnership. They don't want to have competition to dictate uh, uh, the business of the day. Both sides uh, want to have a stable arms control agreement inside Europe and, and it, in the neighborhood. And so there is, there is a lot of cooperation going on. The fact that the Russian foreign minister is joining his colleagues in Berlin today, uh, the fact that, that they all look very careful at what happens in Iran is one example for, for the opportunities that we still have. So cooperation is at hand. Uh, confrontative strategies would probably be the wrong choice for the West. Mr. McCauley, this nationalist drive that was mentioned there, is this something that is spearheaded by Putin and is supported by the majority in Russia? Is it a one-man drive here? Uh, no, no. It, it uh, is responding to the Russian people and uh, the statement by General Balayevsky that uh, Russia would use nuclear weapons first in a conflict is not new. It has been said before. It underlines the fact that Russia is too weak uh, in conventional forces uh, to defeat an enemy, so therefore they're going to go over to the uh, nuclear, op nuclear option. Uh, and uh, one has to look at the, the Russian people. They feel that they've been badly treated since 1991, since the collapse of uh, communism. Uh, a Russian general has complained, a uh, retired Russian general has complained that America treats uh, Russia like Thailand. Uh, Russia expects to be treated as a great power. Russia wants to become the dominant power in Europe, the dominant military, economic and political power in Europe, and then from there become a world power. It's only a, a world power in, in energy and it will use the energy weapon. A gas bomb will be used. The gas weapon will be used uh, as a foreign policy weapon to strengthen Russia uh, and to underline the fact that Russia is a dominant power. And the population will respond to that. We're now in a very, very delicate position from one president, President Putin, to another, uh, the chosen successor, Dmitry Medvedev. The next election will not be a real election. It will just be a virtual election where the Kremlin wants uh, voters to accept uh, Medvedev as a new president. Uh, and this transition period is one uh, which is, uh, c could become quite tense. Uh, and in this period, uh, Russia may be, f in fact, quite bellicose. It will make very strong statements, basically warning off uh, the Americans and the West not to attempt to support opposition candidates uh, uh, because the Kremlin really fears uh, an, uh, an orange revolution in Russia. Okay, you, 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 you uh, excuse me, interrupt you. You're saying that uh, Russia's been particularly belly closed at the moment. But, uh, Mr. Pekiev, what is behind this latest action against the uh, British Cultural Center in Russia? Why is Russia focusing on Britain? Has it taken over from the U.S. as its main adversary? Well, actually, it was a countermeasure. In uh, last summer, uh, the UK government uh, announced on halting talks on facilitating a visa regime between Russian citizen and British citizen, so that uh, it was the British government which links political disagreements about, around Mr. Litvinenko with the humanitarian basket. Uh, and uh, Russia made a countermeasure to close two branches of the uh, British Council in uh, uh, St. Petersburg and Yekaterinburg. Uh, their main office in Moscow still uh, operates relatively freely. And it was justified by the very fact that uh, this council during uh, uh, more than 10 years of its operation in Russia uh, didn't dare to register itself as a, a foreign non-commercial entity, so it violated the Russian law for so many years, and uh, it was tolerated for the sake of the good uh, UK-Russian relations, but uh, last summer Britain decided uh, to make some unfriendly moves uh, against Russia, and Russia reciprocated. Maybe it was not the most elegant way to reciprocate, but, uh, well, Russia has to do something. Do you think it's still it the Lit Litvinenko affair? Is this the burning issue that's driving all this? Well, uh, yes, uh, Britain, at least the British authorities claim that uh, they made certain anti-Russian measures last summer 
uh, as a response to Russian disagreement to extradite Mr. Litvinenko, but, uh, uh, excuse me, to extradite Mr. Lugavoy, who is supposedly a killer of Mr. Litvinenko, but it is uh, directly pro prohibited by Russian constitution. Since that, uh, British ambassador here said that, well, you always violate uh, Russian constitution, why shouldn't you violate it once more? This is not exactly the language any professional diplomat would permit itself. It uh, added some uh, sorrow and sadness into bilateral relationship, and unfortunately, this escalated to uh, present uh, regrettable ex accident. It is regrettable because, indeed, uh, many Russian uh, citizens, I agree with that, suffered from uh, closing uh, those uh, two uh, branches. But fortunately, the Russian government is ready to reopen them if uh, the United Kingdom would meet a certain uh, condition and would demonstrate more respect to a Russian law. Okay, Mr. Rike, let's talk about Kosovo here. I mean, this is quite an important issue as far as relations between Russia and the West is concerned. How do you think this is going to play out and how are you going to make sure that Russia doesn't possibly use a veto in the Security Council? Um, this is going to be a very tricky and, and, and difficult negotiation, but I think um, I, I don't see a solution as, as of now where Serbia and Russia could agree to. So the most likely thing is to, to solve this, this, um, this stalemate and to get a solution on the, on the status of Kosovo that, um, like after the Serbian election now, uh, Kosovo might, might feel uh, entitled to declare independence. And then the United States and most Europeans would, would recognize the country and would, would lay the groundwork not really like the legal groundwork, but the political groundwork to continue with the stabilization operations um, in Kosovo, security-wise with, with NATO, but politically and uh, with regard to the police, now with the European Union. This is absolutely necessary to, to stabilize this conflict. Um, the consequence might, of course, be that Russia is, as it, as it has announced, unwilling to recognize Kosovo, unwilling to accept it as a, a United Nations member, unwilling to um, ac accept something like a Kosovo citizen uh, in traveling to Russia. So there will be problems to come. The second uh, un unintended or um, undesirable con consequence would, would of course be that Russia takes this as a precedent and then declares uh, Abkhazia, the, the, the little strip of land that has um, um, separated itself from Georgia as um, independent or even as part of Russia. And then it, it, it would annex Abkhazia and um, would, uh, in a way, force the Americans to, to, to show and prove that they are not really willing to protect a country like Georgia from this kind of territorial loss. Mr. McCauley, so, do you agree with um, all this? Russia has ha opportunities. Pardon? Well, I, th Excuse I me? think it, it's a very, very dangerous precedent for Russia <clears throat> because they have to really weigh up if they, in fact, uh, support Kosovo and say that uh, uh, they will, in fact, uh, allow Abkhazia and South Ossetia uh, to come into the Russian Federation, why shouldn't Tatarstan or Bashkortostan or Yakutia, Saha Yakutia, or any part of the Russian Federation, why shouldn't they claim that they want to go independent? So if they uh, do that, they enter into uh, a very, very dangerous path and uh, the Russians should think uh, several times about this because they are really tied into Serbia. They can't really reject the Serbian view that Serbia absolutely rejects the fact that Kosovo can go independent. Uh, and if the nationalist uh, Tomislav Nikolic wins the presidential election on the 3rd of February, apparently one of the rumors is he will ask the Russians f uh, to come in with military bases and so on, and Russia will become a major player in Serbia. And uh, Gazprom, as you know, is at present trying to buy the oil and gas industry in Serbia. So Gazprom will become a major player there. And there's going to be a pipeline from uh, Turkmenistan through Bulgaria into, uh, into Serbia as well. So therefore, Russia will become embedded in the Balkans and in many ways embedded in the European Union because the other states around there are in the European Union. So therefore, uh, the Russians are playing for big stakes uh, and uh, they are a major player there. There are indeed. And ge gentlemen, we're going to be taking a short break now, but when we come back, we ask if Russia's growing assertiveness is leading some to question whether Moscow is an emerging threat. Stay with us. <laughs>